Greetings, my name is Paula Newfelt and I'm from uh, Edmonton, Alberta. And hello, I'm Ruth Dirksen Siemens, I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia. Is this how proper courting works? Uh, we both uh, gave papers at a conference here dealing with the uh, Mennonite experience in Siberia. Uh, and so uh, we're in this uh, Mennonite village uh, just west of Omsk, about 120 kilometers west. Uh, and it's uh, a positive, very positive experience to be here. It helps to put into context uh, some of the research that we've been undertaking with respect to the Mennonite experience, especially as it relates to uh, the, the, the 1930s experience of depolitization and also uh, the exile experience, especially in, in Siberia. Please come. Uh, yes, as I'm here, I'm transported to a time probably a hundred years ago, or the time of my great-grandparents and grandparents. It feels in some ways as if nothing has changed. Um, and then my research, of course, reveals that so much changed. I have a corpus of letters, 461 letters, written from people from villages just like this in southern Russia and, and eastern Russian villages, uh, and then those who were sent into the prison camps but wrote letters back to those of the villages and then eventually out to Carlos, Saskatchewan, to Canada. And those letters reveal a, another, the, the dark side. I'm, as I'm here today, I see a utopian vision. Happy children, chickens, uh, eggs, uh, 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 produce, uh, productive. It's, it's really a paradise. But from the letters, uh, it juxtaposed the darkness of the letters. Like what happened in 1930 to 38 is, is uh, the the terror. It's hard for me to imagine okay. that in such an idyllic place, no, no. such a beautiful town. Uh, oh. On April 12, 1930, uh, Henrik Yagoda, deputy head of the OGPU, the secret police of the USSR, drafted a memo. And in that memo, he proposed a massive conversion of the Soviet prison labor camps into colonization settlements. He said the current prison system had become thoroughly rotten. It was time to turn the entire prison system upside down and to colonize the North in the shortest possible time. Instead of sitting in prison cells, inmates would now perform forestry and mining work. In their free time, they would work in vegetable gardens, raise pigs, mow grass, and fish. <laughs> they go to predict that these settlements would become proletarian mining towns that would develop the country's colossal deposits of natural resources. Yagoda's vision eventually became Stalin's gulag, the administrative department that oversaw the forced labor camps across the USSR. Soon, Spetsbosileni, our special settlements, were popping up in the northern and eastern reaches of the USSR in the spring of 1930. The vast majority of special settlers in these special settlements uh, were kulaks, peasants who were branded by the Soviet regime as enemies of the state and who had been disenfranchised, deprived of their property, and exiled in a nationwide campaign commonly referred to as decolacization. By 1931, more than 1.8 million people were toiling in the special settlements scattered across the USSR. Written by 33 different family groups, written between 1930 and 1938. The writers are Russian citizens from Mennonite communities, most of whom were categorized as kulaks. One third of the letters are written from special settlements, euphemisms sometimes for prison camps or labor camps. In the Ural Mountains near Perm, not that far from here. Two thirds of the letters are written in southern Mennonite home villages in Zagradovka, present day Ukraine. More than 50 years later, in 1989, the letters were found by Peter Bargan, whose parents had received the letters. Peter Bargan lived in Carlisle, Saskatchewan, in Canada. The letters were found in a Campbell soup box in an attic. Here they traveled for 60 years from attic to attic until Peter and Anne Bargan finally found them. For the following three years, Anne Peters Bargan translated the entire corpus of 461 letters into English and Peter edited the collection. Letters are often perceived as a communicative bridge between sender and receiver. This bridge is often able to expand great distances. However, the writers of the 461 letters in this corpus, despite their desire to bridge distances, are impeded by prison guards, limited by censors, restricted by betraying neighbors, and constrained by a perilous system of mail delivery, all of which expose a chasm, not a bridge. The writers 
circumstances increase their anxiety, impede their word choice, and limit their use of epistolary conventions of the genre, such as dates, salutations, complimentary closes. Very few letters begin with a, 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 an address, and dear, so and so, and very few of them, and yours sincerely, the complimentary close. They don't have those kind of genre markers. Hence, certain writers found it necessary to write through the flowers. German wir sprechen durch die Blumen, or schreiben durch die Blumen. Soviet Mennonites were some of the first to be targeted for dekulakization and exile. And their experiences are documented in autobiographies, as well as hundreds of letters that are published in Der Bote, Die Mennonitische Rundschau, and Sehensbote. And that's what, uh, those are my primary sources for this uh, article. So why were Mennonites targeted in the first place? Well, in some of my other research, I've come to a number of conclusions on that, on that particular topic. First, Mennonites had larger land holdings than, than their non-Mennonite neighbors. Uh, especially in Ukraine. They had negotiated during NEP a special agreements that would give them additional land. In many cases, they had twice as much land as the average Ukrainian peasant. And so naturally, they had more land when decolacization occurred, and naturally, there would be an obvious target for uh, decolacization. A second reason why they were targeted was because of past counter-revolutionary behavior. They had opposed the Bolsheviks during the October Revolution, they supported German occupation troops during the Civil War, and so that naturally made them enemies of the state. A third factor was anti-German sentiment, especially amongst government officials. Many government officials assumed that every German village was a Kulak village, and so naturally you would attack uh, and uh, undertake your dekulakization uh, in those particular villages. A fourth reason was because of the strong religious and ethnic cohesiveness in the Mennonite villages, Officials believe that they, if they decoolize and exile those villages, that would drive a wedge between the Mennonite <coughs> leadership and their congregations, ignite class warfare, and help to dissolve uh, the communities. And finally, decoolization was used to punish Mennonites for their past immigration activities, especially in the fall of 1929, when more than 9,000 Soviet Mennonites tried to escape via Moscow. Uh, in many Mennonite populated regions, mass deportations began in February of 1930. So for example, in the Ukraine, uh, the OGPU scheduled most rail transports of Kulaks to leave between February 18th and March 22nd, 1930. Uh, officials, OGPU uh, officials rounded up the prisoners, brought them to collection points. In some cases, the prisoners were held in custody for a number of weeks, uh, but eventually they were brought to the railway tracks, loaded into uh, uh, cattle cars, uh, or coal cars uh, with their families uh, and then uh, shipped off, uh, to, uh, off north. Uh, these cattle cars were often referred to as the red wagons, which were used to haul cattle uh, and freight. Uh, and often in these cattle cars, you would have anywhere between 40 and 60 people. Uh, often these people were herded into these cattle cars at gunpoint. Uh, the doors were locked uh, and the people uh, were, uh, were sent north. Uh, and these people, uh, these Mennonite exiles in these cattle cars, of course, had no idea where they were going. During the first months of 1930, most Mennonites, especially living on the western side of the Urals, did not go to Siberia. They went straight north, to the northern territory, to the Komi region, and also to those regions along the western slopes uh, of Siberia. And why was that the case? Well, because party leaders in Siberia did not want to be importing kulaks into their own territory. They complained to Moscow, we've got plenty of kulaks right here. We don't need any more kulaks. Uh, and if you're going to be sending us kulaks, you're going to have to As I walk these streets, I feel I'm grieving. I'm grieving the losses, what we lost. Yes, our parents were the lucky ones to get out before the horror, but if only that hadn't happened, if only we could have stayed, what we would have gained, uh, built on the generations and generations who lived here. Having left all of this, there's an absence. There, there's a, um, a pain that I feel of, of, the, of the loss of that. If only we could have stayed, if only there hadn't been the violent revolution, if only there hadn't been Stalin's horrific policies, and we could have stayed. What what